Good afternoon, folks. My name is Steve Edmund, and I'm going to be doing what is effectively my first ever oral code review. Now, I do not have a super professional setup uh, here right now, um, so bear with me if you hear background noise, and I do have a script, so you will hear pages flipping. Uh, this code review is going to be broken up into three main categories, which will be software design and engineering, algorithms and data structure, and databases. Now I have nine points that I want to hit on for all of those three categories. One through three will touch on software design and engineering. Four through six, we'll touch on algorithms and data structure. And seven through nine will be databases. <clears throat> so let's get started. Now, number one uh, is a review of the existing functionality using the code review checklist for software design and engineering. So what we have here is uh, the main Python code with Dash and Pandas and everything like that uh, that gets this project going. Now this project uh, was from CS340 and it is essentially a full stack web app. So we developed uh, you know the code now I didn't personally develop this code I did add to it and you know did the things that I had to do to make it functional for what I was doing but by and large this code right here was all pre-written for us and this is the crud module now I did uh, write all of this code so, but the function of this full stack web application was basically an animal shelter where rescuers could go to this website. And if they had a particular dog that they wanted to um, look for, you know, whether it was mountain rescue, water rescue, things of that nature, uh, they could search specifically for animals that were good for that. And it brought up a nice little pie chart, you know, that had the different breeds for each of the uh, rescue types. Uh, there was a map. If you selected uh, a particular animal, uh, it would bring up on the map, you know, where they were located uh, in Texas, so on and so forth. So... Pretty neat little application. Uh, I was new to MongoDB completely. I, I'm pretty familiar with relational databases, um, but this was the first time I had ever worked with a non-relational database. And when I say I was lost in the beginning, boy, I'm not kidding. I was lost because I'm used to tables and uh, keys and, and that kind of thing. So it, it was definitely a new experience for me. So that leads me to my enhancements and everything, and we'll get to that. But we'll go step by step so as I don't get lost. Now, a review of the existing functionality for software design and engineering. Now... The application in its current form does show a reasonable level of modularity. One of the prime examples is the segregation of the CRUD operations into a separate module, as you see here. You know, so this is separated, this CRUD module is separated from, you know, this main uh, uh, code base. So this separation is good for both readability and future code maintenance. You know, so I can use this CRUD module over and over and over, you know, with some minor modifications. Of course, you know, that's going to have to change. Uh, this Mongo client, I don't know if people can actually read uh, the code on the screen, you know, but self-client, 
uh, equals Mongo client, you know, of course that's going to change with my enhancement. Um, issues with the existing functionality uh, lies within the map rendering part of the application. Here, code blocks are repeated, creating redundancy and also making it harder to manage or debug. For instance, the marker placement code appears to be copy-pasted multiple times, differing only in terms of the data they operate on. And that is particularly this section. So you can see here with the map, it's literally copy and pasted. It's the, it's the same basic code structure just with different columns that it's calling upon. Um, you know, it, it's cumbersome and and again, it's redundant. Sorry for that break I was uh, reading. Now, the impact of repetitive code is not only, it's harder to read, but it also increases the potential for errors. So if a bug exists in the logic, the repetitive nature of the code means the bug, the bug is likely duplicated, complicating the debugging efforts. Um, and it, we'll get we'll get to the, the the meat of some other issues I see, but. I would recommend, again, sorry for this break. Uh, I wish I could edit, but I can't in this current format that I'm using. Um, so just bear with me. There, there will be likely more pauses in my speaking. Um, I'm trying not to overlap, you know, the enhancements with uh, the existing stuff but I think it's going to be inevitable because I can't help myself but talk about the enhancement as I'm going along. So I was going to say a, a more modular approach can be employed here by extracting these similar blocks of code into a single function or method and parameterizing the varying elements. This would uh, definitely increase, sorry, decrease uh, the redundancy or eliminate the redundancy. Um, this would make the code more readable and also reduce potential errors and make future changes easier. The function can then be reused every time a marker needs to be placed on the map, cutting down on lines of code and centralizing the logic for easier updates. So imagine a function like the create marker data row where data row is the information needed for a single map marker this would replace the repetitive blocks of code currently responsible for creating these markers which is which is these here uh, i don't know why this was done this way because here i'll show you week two I will show you the data set. Now this is a modified uh, data set because the original was, I mean, it had so many different animals and really I just took out everything that was not a cat or a dog. So now if I, let me just, Okay, so you can see the column names here, age upon outcome, animal ID, animal type, breed, color, date of birth, date, time, month, year, etc. So you can see all these column names. Now these can be translated into, um, you know, into a relational database where, you know, I can call on this particular if I want to look at animal ID or if I want to look, you know, just for domestic short hair mixed cats, you know, I can, in theory, just use an SQL query, which 
I am looking at uh, building into the enhanced web application. Um, I, I can create a query that will look for just domestic short hair mix or uh, uh, Australian Kelpie pit bull, whatever. Or if I want a particular age, you know, I can look for that as well. So I have modified this data set, but this is effectively the original data set that was used in, in the original project. So going on, um, the benefit of this future development is adopting a more modular structure that will also make it easier to extend the application's features. For example, if the app were to evolve to allow real-time marker updates, having a centralized create marker, quote unquote, function would make this feature easier to implement. Um, in the current state, our application exhibits several characteristics of clean code, and it's structured in a way that aligns with general best practices and is partitioned to make different modules easily discernible. However, upon deeper dive, we encounter repetitive code segments, especially in the map rendering section. Such repetitive blocks not only increase the code base's size unnecessarily, but they also make future changes more cumbersome. So if a logic in the repetitive code block needs modification, it might have to be altered in multiple places, increasing the chances of bugs. So one of the foundational principles of writing clean code is the dry principle, or don't repeat yourself. This principle underscores the importance of encapsulating repeated logic into separate functions or methods, making the code more concise, less error prone, and more maintainable. When you have a single source of truth, changes are easier to make and the chances of inconsistencies are significantly minimized. So beyond just repetition, clean code also touches on consistent formatting, uneven indentations, inconsistent naming conventions, and even lack of proper spacing can make the code appear more complicated than it is. And I will say, uh, when I first looked at this code, it seemed way more complicated than it needed to be. Um, you know, like I said before, it it, I, it wasn't only the database. I mean, it, it, it was the code, too, that really kind of threw me off. So by refining these areas, the code won't just function better. It will also be a testament to the best practices in software engineering, making it more adaptable and resilient to future changes. Uh, and this brings me next to comments. Now, it looks like there's a lot of commenting going on, but in reality, they don't really, they don't really describe anything very well. It's a lot of fix me's and this kind of thing. Well-written comments and documentations are the roadmaps of your code base, and they don't just explain what the code is doing. They clarify what it's doing and why it's doing it that way, providing context that the code itself cannot. And this is particularly useful for complex algorithms or business logic where the why is not immediately obvious. So the current application has some comments which you know, make the initial navigation through the code base a bit smoother, but these comments are more descriptive than they are explanatory, as I just said, meaning they state what the code is doing, but not necessarily why it is doing it. Additionally, there is a lack of comprehensive documentation at both the function and the module levels. And that's even, um, you know, I know this is, pretty self-explanatory, but I, I'm going to need to go in here and create better comments, even for the, the CRUD module that I created. 
so you know the challenges of poor documentation or insufficient or even unclear documentation can significantly impede the onboarding process for new developers and it can also make debugging and expanding the application much more challenging anyone who revisits the code later including the original developers might find it difficult to remember why certain decisions were made in software engineering, the collective memory loss could be expensive, both in terms of time and quality. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip through here because I'm lagging. Uh, we're going to go on to error handling. So... Proper error handling isn't just about catching exceptions. Uh, it's an art and a science of anticipating what can go wrong, gracefully managing those situations and providing meaningful feedback for both the users and developers. And robust error handling enhances user experience and makes the system more resilient and simplifies debugging. Now, the application in its current form uses rudimentary error handling techniques and while it has mechanisms to check for null values such as none uh, it appears to overlook some common problematic scenarios for example while crud operations over here you know they do check for none uh, they may not account for uh, data type mismatches or unexpected data formats um, or underlying database connection issues even. So consequences of this uh, issues can escalate into more significant problems. For users, an unexpected error could mean a system crash or an unintelligible error message. For developers, the lack of descriptive error messaging can turn debugging into a prolonged and tedious endeavor. In severe cases, poor error handling can lead to data loss and even corruption. So I'll be introducing more granular error checks uh, in all of this code. This code is pretty much going to be completely rewritten. Um, such as, I mean, just for the error handling alone, it's really crucial to anticipate and handle other potential issues like uh, handling specific database exceptions. This helps in identifying if there's a connection problem or a query error or even data integrity issues. Um, error checks for input validation. I mean, that's a, that's a big one because, you know, people are usually the number one reason for things going haywire so input validation is a big one ensuring that data being passed to functions or saved to the database adheres to expected formats and types and uh, timeout handling especially in web applications that rely on external systems like databases they should have timeouts to ensure that the system remains responsive and uh this is going to bring me on to section number two, analysis using the checklist. Now, we were given a checklist, and some of it um, was pertinent to my project, and some of it wasn't. So, analysis using the checklist. Understanding responsibility segregation. At its core, the concept of segregating responsibility is rooted in the foundational principle of the separation of concerns. Each module, function, or class should ideally have one responsibility and should execute it well. When software components are narrowly focused and independent, they become easier to test, maintain, and reuse. So the present scenario um, in, in this current application as it is, it does showcase a separation of concerns, especially with the CRUD operations being isolated. 
this modular approach indicates a design that's leaning towards scalability and maintainability, but it's not 100% there. So I'm going to be moving this from MongoDB into Django, and, and this is where I'm going to kind of overlap a little bit here. So I'm going to be moving it into Django database, uh, sorry, not Django database, uh, a Django uh, framework and a PostgreSQL database. And now with Django, the model view controller pattern offers a structured way to further separate responsibilities. Um, the models handle the data and the business logic that communicate with the database and update the view whenever the data changes. The views represent the UI. They display the data from the model to the user and send user commands to the controller. And the controllers act as inter inter an interface between model and view, receiving user input and deciding what to do with it. So Django being a high level Python web framework follows a slightly modified pattern known as the model view template. While the underlying principle remains the same, the main difference lies in how the framework handles the controller part. In Django, the framework itself takes care of the controller part, loosely speaking and developers deal more with views and models. Now the benefits of embracing this MVC slash MVT uh, model is scalability. Scalability, uh, as the application grows, you know, we need scalability. Keeping distinct layers means you can scale them independently for example, if the data layer becomes a bottleneck, it can be scaled without touching the UI layer, and that's really important. Reusability. So components, especially models, can be reused across different parts of the application. This promotes the dry principle, reducing repetition and potential errors. Uh, easier maintenance. There's flexibility in the UI changes. Um, I, I think it's going to be really, this enhancement's going to be really awesome. So transitioning to Django and embracing MVT. So as you pivot to Django, the inherent design of the framework nudges developers toward this separation. Uh, however, it is vital to stay vigilant. While the framework promotes the MVT pattern, careless design choices can still muddy these separations. So it is up to the developer to maintain clear boundaries, ensuring that each component strictly adheres to its designed and designated responsibility. So enhanced error handling, uh, fundamentals of robust error handling. One of the marks of high quality software is its ability to gracefully handle unexpected situations, errors, or exceptions. Instead of crashing or displaying cryptic messages, it should inform the user about the issue in, an un in understandable terms and where possible, provide a way to recover or continue. Now in the present state, while the application currently employs basic checks like determining if the data is none, as we have previously discussed, it might not be equipped to handle more complex and unforeseen scenarios uh, like a network outage, uh, a poorly handled database operation might lead the user to perceive the application as broken or unreliable and then they just won't use it. You know, and that's not good for anybody. Um, I feel like this is really kind of over overlapping a little too much here. So user input errors, the user might enter data that doesn't match the expected formats. Uh, informative feedback can guide them toward the correct input without frustration. External API failures, so if your application depends on external devices, they might fail or provide unexpected data. 
Anticipating and handling these anomalies can be crucial. Uh, limitations of resources. For instance, if there's an upload feature, users might try to upload exceedingly large files, straining server resources. Now that's not really going to be an issue uh, in my even my enhanced project. Uh, I am considering uh, making it to where a user can input uh, and add a, a rescue animal to the database. I'm not sure if I'm going to implement that yet or not. Uh, so I don't think that's going to be an issue for what we are doing here with this project. Now, expanding the scope of error handling isn't merely about catching errors. It's a user-centric approach. It recognizes that errors will happen, and, and they do all the time. And, but it strives to mitigate their impact on the user experience. By enhancing error handling, we can make the application more resilient and also boost user confidence and trust in the system. And that's really you know, what it's about when you're creating these web applications. You know, it's for the user. And if they, if they don't have confidence and trust in the system that you have created, then you've already lost. So on to number three, enhancements. And I know I've already discussed some enhancements at this point. Um, but as I said, we will have some overlapping issues, and I am sorry if you can hear my dog barking. So, enhancements and course outcomes. Uh, so, Django's MVC model view controller and the ORM, the object relational mapping capabilities. By leveraging Django's MVC architecture, distinct roles can be allocated to handling, to data handling, uh, sorry, uh, which is the model. Interfer interface representation, or the view, and application logic, which is the controller. This delineation permits components to operate independently, making the system more robust, flexible, and easier to manage. The ORM, on the other hand, streamlines database interactions, converting intricate SQL queries into more intuitive Python methods, which inherently boost security by reducing SQL injection vulnerabilities. Um, now, I'm also going to uh, implement logging. So we definitely, for this, uh, we need more comprehensive logging. So a holistic approach to logging doesn't solely capture errors. Instead, it offers a transparent lens into an application's operational state. By encompassing information logs, debug logs, and warning logs, developers gain an insightful diagnostic tool, invaluable for rectifying issues, preempting problems, and refining performance. Uh, now, I will also be doing a lot of code refactoring, you know, because as I said, um, I, I was never really, I never really liked the code the way this is written. It is cumbersome, redundant, and I just don't like it. You know, there's, there's a lot going on here that, for my personal preference and Maybe it's not even my personal preference alone, um, but there, there's a lot going on here that really needs to be changed. So there will be code refactoring, and the essence of clean and maintainable code is continuous improvement. So I'll be revising and improving the existing code without altering its external functionality. And this can optimize performance, enhance readability, and mitigate potential future errors. Regular refactoring sessions ensure the code remains agile and adaptable to future modifications. Uh, now, I do think it is pertinent 
to uh, implement integration and uh, unit testing. So as the software grows, ensuring its reliability is crucial. Incorporating rigorous testing, both at the unit and integration levels, guarantees that each of these component functions as intended and interacts seamlessly with others. So the implementation of Django's MVC and ORM underpins a nuanced grasp of contemporary software design methodologies, underscoring the pivotal role of structured modular design in crafting scalable and efficient software solutions. Comprehensive logging isn't merely a reactionary tool, it symbolizes a proactive, forward-thinking approach to software creation, underscoring the integral facets of software lifecycle management, particularly emphasizing continuous monitoring and maintenance. And embracing refactoring manifests a commitment to code quality and software agility. It reflects a developer's or team's determination to deliver a product that's not just functional now, but remains adaptable and efficient in the long run. Recognizing the indispensability of robust testing paradigms signifies a dedication to software reliability, showcasing a keen understanding of ensuring consistent software behavior across various scenarios and changes. And I think that adding these elements provides a holistic view of the software design and engineering landscape. And as a wrap up of the software design and engineering, I think the course outcomes touch on CS 499-02, design, develop, and deliver professional quality, oral, written, and visual communications that are coherent, technically sound, and appropriately adapted to specific audiences and contexts. It also, uh, I think, touches on CS 499-03, design and evaluate computing solutions that solve a given problem using algorithmic principles and computer science practices and standards appropriate to its solution while managing the trade-offs involved in design choices. I think it touches on uh, CS 499-04, demonstrate an ability to use well-founded and innovative techniques, skills, and tools in computing practices for the purpose of implementing computer solutions that deliver value and accomplish industry-specific goals. And lastly, I think it touches also on CS 499-05, develop a security mindset that anticipates adversarial exploits in software architecture and designs to expose potential vulnerabilities, mitigate design flaws, and ensure privacy and enhanced security of data and resources. So that is going to bring us next to Section four, review existing functionality of algorithms and data structures. The heart of the application's computational logic is nestled within the iterative processing methods. This methodology, methodological choice is particularly evident in tasks such as the rendering of map markers on initial assessment, this approach offers several advantages. Iterative methods, especially in a language as straightforward as Python, often translate to code that's more legible. This legibility ensures that even developers new to the project can quickly grasp the underlying logic 
and contribute efficiently. Each iteration can be seen as a single unit of operation, allowing the system to handle every piece of data with consistency. This translates to fewer unexpected outcomes when dealing with the current data set. Given the deterministic nature of loops, it is relatively easier to predict system behavior for a known set of inputs, making debugging and troubleshooting less of a challenge. However, as with all things in software engineering, this method comes with its own set of trade-offs. There are scalability concerns. As the data set grows, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, this isn't going to be the case uh, with this particular project, but as the data set grows, the linear nature of iterative methods means the processing time can increase proportionally. In a real-world scenario, when data could multiply rapidly, such as linear increment, might not be sustainable. Imagine a situation where the data set is 10 or 100 times larger. The time taken to process, process such data would multiply, leading, leading to potential performance bottlenecks. And then there's memory overheads. So each iterative process can have its own memory overhead. For large data sets, this can lead to significant memory consumption which could affect other operations or even lead to system slowdowns. Uh, now there are optimization challenges. While iterative methods can be optimized to a degree, they may not always be the most efficient way to handle large data sets. More advanced algorithmic strategies might be better suited for scalability and efficiency in such cases. So while the current approach serves its purpose for the existing data set size, a forward-looking assessment would prompt us to consider algorithmic strategies that are more scalable, especially as the application's user base and data requirements grow. Um, you know, and if this were a real-world application and I were to implement something like I had mentioned earlier where um, you know, people who found an animal and they wanted to add it to the database, you know, for uh, these adoptions, you know, the, the data set could grow. So efficiency. Um, the backbone of many operations within the application include map rendering logic is rooted in iterative processing. This approach has its merits, especially in scenarios with manageable data sizes, where it offers directness and often clearer code logic. However, as we delve deeper, several implications emerge when considering its efficiency, particularly for vast data sets. So there's time complexity. So iterative solutions often carry linear time complexity denoted as O of N, big uh, O of N, where N represents the data set's size. This means that if the data set doubles, the processing time could potentially double as well. Such linearity may be acceptable for small to medium data sets, but as the data grows, this can rapidly become a bottleneck. In contrast, uh, certain optimized algorithms or data structures might offer logarithmic uh, big O of log N or uh, constant big O of 1 time complexities, drastically reducing processing times for larger data sets. And then there are space considerations. So beyond just time, iterative solutions can sometimes require more memory, which with each iteration there might be additional memory requirements, either due to memory, or excuse me, either due to temporary variables or intermediary data storage. When the data set is extensive, this space overhead can become quite significant. The potential for optimization. 
The beauty of computer science is that there's often more than one way to solve a problem. The iterative method is just one approach. More advanced data structures, such as trees or graphs, might offer faster access times for specific tasks. Furthermore, algorithms like divide and conquer, dynamic programming, or even heuristic-based solutions might present optimized pathways for certain tasks. So real world implications. Consider an application where users expect near instant feedback, such as map interactions. A delay caused by inefficient algorithms can effectively, a delay caused by inefficient algorithms can directly influence user satisfaction and overall experience. In an era where responsiveness is paramount, having suboptimal algorithms could have tangible business repercussions. In essence, while iterative processing serves the current needs, it's imperative to maintain a proactive stance as the application scales and user expectations evolve, embracing more efficient algorithms or data structures will be pivotal move to ensure sustained performance and user satisfaction. On to number five, my apologies, my dogs, for some reason decided to go crazy just when I'm doing this. So I am texting my wife, asking her to please put them in the other room. Number five, anal analysis using the checklist. Uh, this is algorithms and data structure. So the data structures, at the heart of the current application, we find the data frames driving much of the logic. Originating from libraries such as pandas, data frames are incredibly versatile, providing extensive functionalities like easy data manipulation and querying. This adaptability makes them an attractive choice for handling tabular data, especially when the focus is on analytics or data transformations. However, one must remember that while data frames are powerful, they might not always be the most efficient or appropriate data structure for the task. For example, when we're merely collecting and storing a series of items, a simple list could be more memory efficient. Lists in Pythons are dynamic and can store a range of data types, making them suitable for a sequence of data or sorry, suitable for sequences of data. Similarly, dictionaries in Python, which store data as key pair values, key value pairs, excuse me, can offer rapid lookups and are highly efficient when we need to retrieve values based on unique keys. Suppose the application has functionalities where associating values with unique identifiers is crucial. In that case, dictionaries might offer a performance advantage over data frames, especially when the database grows. As the application transitions and scales, keeping an open mind about which data structure to use is vital. While data frames are excellent for certain tasks, sometimes the simplicity and the efficiency of basic Python data structures like lists or dictionaries can lead to better performance and cleaner code. By analyzing the specific needs and bottlenecks of the application, one can make informed decisions on the appropriate data structures to employ, optimizing both memory usage and execution speed. So algorithm optimization. Transitioning to a PostgreSQL 
brings along a different set of challenges, especially in the realm of query optimization. PostgreSQL, being a relational database, thrives on well-structured, efficient queries to deliver the best performance. This efficiency becomes particularly paramount as data scales with every millisecond of query time potentially translating to significant costs and lag, especially in applications requiring real-time data access. Delving into Django, it becomes equipped with a powerful object relational mapping system or ORM system. The ORM abstracts away much of the SQL, allowing developers to interact with the database using Python-like syntax. This abstraction is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it dramatically simplifies database interactions, making CRUD operations more intuitive and reducing the likelihood of SQL injection attacks. On the other, there's a hidden danger. ORMs, if used without a deep understanding of the underlying SQL they generate, can lead to inefficient queries. A simple ORM command might result in a complex, time-consuming SQL statement that fetches far more data than is needed or scans tables inefficiently. It is imperative to frequently audit the SQL queries generated by the ORM. Tools like Django Debug Toolbar can assist in this, providing insights into the queries and their execution times. This proactive monitoring can help in spotting potential bottlenecks or inefficiencies. <coughs> Excuse me. Beyond just monitoring, knowledge of database indexing and understanding of join operations can significantly enhance query performance. In PostgreSQL, proper indexing can turn a query that took minutes into one that takes mere milliseconds. Further, as data set grows, algorithmic strategies such as caching frequently accessed data or using lazy loading techniques can be invaluable. These strategies minimize database hits, reduce server load, and enhance the overall user experience by providing faster access times. So while Django's ORM is a formidable tool that makes database interactions more Pythonic and secure, it demands respect and understanding. Mastery over its intricacies combined with regular audits and a solid grasp of PostgreSQL's optimization techniques will ensure the application runs smoothly, efficiently, and scales gracefully. And even though I have talked about some of the enhancements already, this all brings us to number six, enhancements and course outcomes. So Pandas integration. The Python ecosystem boasts a rich set of libraries with Pandas standing out for data manipulation. By harnessing its capabilities, we can optimize operations that once seemed complex, like data aggregation or filtering, especially when navigating large data sets. It offers functionalities that go beyond standard Python lists or dictionaries, allowing for faster and more efficient data operations. Uh, the map data rendering refinement. So as the app scales, the current map data rendering logic might face bottlenecks. Investigating alternative approaches such as pre-processing data or even leveraging caching mechanisms can be vital. This would entail breaking down the rendering process, identifying time into intensive operations, and strategizing ways to streamline them. By doing so, the application's performance remains smooth and responsive, regardless of the size of the data set. Uh, and this now brings us to search optimization. So with growing data sets, search operations can become a bottleneck. Implementing optimized search algorithms, such as binary search for ordered data sets or 
tree structures for efficient string searches can vastly enhance user experience. For applications with spatial data or pathfinding needs, more complex algorithms like A can be considered. The goal is to ensure that as the data grows, the search times don't escalate exponentially, preserving the app's responsiveness. Um, by integrating libraries like Pandas, it showcases a developer's ability to recognize the value of specialized data structures. It's not just about knowing that these structures exist, but understanding when and why to use them, emphasizing the nuances of software efficiency. Uh, revamping and optimizing core functionalities like the map data rendering and search processes is a testament to a developer's skill in recognizing performance challenges and strategically addressing them. It indicates a mature approach to problem solving where one not only fixes issues but anticipates and prevents potential future challenges. Uh, as far as course outcomes, I do think uh, CS499-04 definitely applies uh, for this, which is demonstrate an ability to use well-founded and innovative techniques, skills, and tools in computing practices for the purpose of implementing computer solutions that deliver and that deliver value and accomplish industry specific goals. Now we are on to number seven, review of existing functionality for databases. So we are on the last third of this code review and I am oh my this is 52 minutes long I will try and get through this quickly review of existing functionality databases so document oriented storage which is what MongoDB is um, one of MongoDB's most distinct features is its document-oriented storage model. Unlike relational databases that use tables, MongoDB stores data in BSON documents. This format is both human-readable and capable of storing complex nested data, which makes it versatile for various use cases. It's also schema-less. So MongoDB's schema-less design allows greater flexibility, catering to evolving application needs. You can dynamically add or remove fields, making it ideal for applications that are still discovering their feature set. In the current app, this schema-less design has been leveraged for prototyping and adaptability. Now the CRUD operations in our application are tailored to MongoDB's unique characteristics. For instance, queries are constructed using JSON-like documents, and it's possible to query nested data and arrays directly. MongoDB's query language is rich, offering a wide range of capabilities, including text search and geospatial queries, which are actively used in our application. Data relationships, um, MongoDB allows for different types of data relationships like embedded data and linking. In our current application, the focus has been primarily on embedding documents to capture relationships as it aligns well with MongoDB's document-oriented structure. Now, MongoDB is designed for scalability using features like automatic sharding to distribute data across multiple servers. However, our current app has not yet needed to leverage this for scaling horizontally, you know, because it is a relatively small data set. I think the original data set was about 10,000 lines, um, you know, and after I modified it to only include cats and dogs, I'm not sure how many lines 
uh, it is now, but definitely somewhat less. <clears throat> so flexibility versus structure. MongoDB's flexibility is both its strength and its Achilles heel. It allows quick development, but can introduce challenges in data consistency and integrity, especially when the application grows. In the existing app, the design reflects this trade-off with flexible data models that can sometimes make it challenging to enforce specific data integrity rules, which brings us to data integrity and transactions. So while MongoDB does support ACID transactions as a 4.0, they are not as central to its design as in relational databases. Our current application makes limited use of transactions given that MongoDB traditionally encourages a more flexible approach to data integrity. This comprehensive view shows that while MongoDB has facilitated a rapid and flexible development environment for our application, it also leaves some areas to ponder upon, especially as we consider the future scalability and complexity of the application. Now we are at number eight, analysis of databases. So the schema design. So unlike MongoDB's schemaless architecture, PostgreSQL demands a well-defined schema. And this involves deciding the tables, their relationships, and constraints up front. A carefully crafted schema is not just a blueprint but central to both performance and data integrity. Normalization versus denormalization. In a, relation, in a relational database like PostgreSQL, one of the critical design considerations is the degree of normalization. While MongoDB often encourages embedding related documents for quick access, PostgreSQL would generally require a balance between normalization and denormalization to optimize query performance and maintain data integrity. Uh, PostgreSQL offers a variety of indexing techniques like B-tree, hash, and more specialized forms like GIST or generalized search tree. Unlike MongoDB, where indexing can be somewhat ad hoc, PostgreSQL indexing should be planned and meticulously should be planned meticulously to optimize query performance. So PostgreSQL supports a wide range of data types, including custom types, which provide more control but also demands more foresight in database design. For instance, choosing between integer or serial or between varchar and text can have implications for both storage and query performance. While MongoDB uses a collection level locking mechanism, PostgreSQL uses multi-version concurrency control. This allows for more transactions to be processed concurrently, but, per, but requires proper transaction management in the application code. Stored procedures and triggers. PostgreSQL allows for stored procedures and triggers enabling more business logic to be handled at the database level. This can be both a feature and a potential pitfall depending on the application's needs and the developer's expertise. Security. PostgreSQL has built-in support for SSL and a robust role-based authentication, which is more comprehensive compared to MongoDB. Transitioning to PostgreSQL would require adapting the security measures accordingly, which is uh, a large part of why I chose PostgreSQL. Uh, security is a concern. You know, hard coding, uh, logins, 
is a big no-no. And I, I think that uh, with, with uh, Postgres, po- uh, PostgreSQL, you know, its security features, along with uh, my, um, Django, you know, I, I think we'll have a more robust and more secure um, web application. So transitioning from MongoDB to PostgreSQL involves a paradigm shift. Uh, While MongoDB offers flexibility and is forgiving in terms of schema design, PostgreSQL demands a lot more upfront planning and ongoing maintenance to ensure that the database design is both performant and sustainable in the long run. And this brings us to queries and SQL optimization and transition. Language shift. So MongoDB, Mongo, MongoDB operates using BSON, and its query language is fundamentally different from the SQL employed by PostgreSQL. Transitioning requires developers to shift from MongoDB's document-centric queries to SQL's table-based requests. Complexity and versatility of SQL. Now, I have a lot of experience with SQL. I love it. And SQL provides a multifaceted querying system allowing for a wide range of operations, including joins, subqueries, CTEs, which is common table expressions, window functions, and more. This versatility can extract intricate data relationships, but it also demands a solid grounding in SQL to write efficient and performant queries, which is true. Uh, You can write the most basic SQL query and you can get the most broad, basic um, data returned to you. Um, But the better you become in SQL and writing queries, uh, you can really refine what you return. So optimization techniques. As PostgreSQL houses relational data, understanding how to craft optimal SQL queries become pivotal. This means leveraging explain plans to examine how the database executes queries making appropriate use of indexing and understanding the underlying mechanics like table scans, nested loops, and hash joins. Normalization impacts. As data in PostgreSQL is often normalized, retrieving a comprehensive data set might need multiple joint operations. This contrasts with MongoDB, where related data may might be embedded with a single document, thus the cost of joins and the implications on query speed must be considered. Parameterized queries and prepared statements. So to prevent SQL injection attacks and sometimes to optimize performance, it is important to use parameterized queries or prepared statements. While MongoDB has its security concerns, SQL injection is a unique challenge posed by relational databases that requires attention. Transactions and concurrency. MongoDB and PostgreSQL handle transactions differently. PostgreSQL supports full asset, which is atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability compliant transactions, allowing for complex multi-statement transactions. Mastering this requires understanding un, understanding the nuances of commit, rollback, and transaction isolation levels in PostgreSQL. Caching mechanisms. PostgreSQL has its caching mechanism, the shared buffers, Knowing how to configure and utilizing this cache, especially for frequently executed queries, 
can make a profound difference in application responsiveness. Transitioning the query paradigm from MongoDB to PostgreSQL is not just about changing the syntax, but understanding the depth and the breadth of SQL. It requires developers to adapt to new techniques, challenges, and optimization strategies. This transition is a journey of mastering the intricacies of a powerful relational database system, ensuring data retrieval is both accurate and efficient. And now this uh, brings us to number nine, the final, final number nine, enhancement and course outcomes of databases. So normalization in PostgreSQL. Transitioning to a relational database like PostgreSQL calls for a profound understanding of schema design. Through normalization, we are not only making the data storage more efficient, but also ensuring that data remains consistent and free from anomalies. Properly normalized databases reduce data redundancy and improve data integrity. Harnessing Django's ORM. With the vast capabilities Django offers, its object relational mapping system stands out. The ORM provides an abstracted layer to interact with the database, allowing developers to work with the databases using Python code rather than SQL queries. This abstraction aids in code readability, maintainability, and significantly reduces the chance of SQL-related errors. As someone who has worked with databases, relational databases particularly, uh, it is surprising how um, people can really mess up a query. So, you know, having a prepackaged, if you will, query uh, that people can run would definitely benefit particularly this application. Um, so making, additionally, Django's ORM can adapt to different database backends, making future transitions or scaling more seamless. Now the course outcomes of this, by emphasizing the importance of normalization, we underscore a profound understanding of relational database design. This not only exhibits knowledge, but a deep appreciation for the nuances of database efficiency, consistency, and data integrity. Integrating Django's ORM into our application development process reflects a clear comprehension of modern database techniques. Leveraging tools, leveraging such tools signifies our adapt adaptability and readiness to harness advanced technologies showing our expertise in abstracting and simplifying databases complexities for more streamlined application development. And the course outcomes for this uh, particularly would be CS499-03, design and evaluate computing solutions that solve a given problem using algorithmic principles and computer science practices and standards appropriate to its solution while managing the trade-offs involved in design choices. CS499-04, Demonstrate an ability to use well-founded and innovative techniques, skills, and tools in computing practices for the purpose of implementing computer solutions that deliver value and accomplish industry-specific goals. And finally, CS499-05, develop a security mindset that anticipates adversarial exploits in software architecture and designs to expose potential vulnerabilities, mitigate design flaws, and ensure privacy enhanced security of data and resources. 
And this is the conclusion of my code review. And I know this was probably not your typical code review because my code is, you know, roughly 500 lines uh, in total between the two, a little more than 500. Um, you know, and I, I did need to discuss databases and algorithms and data structures and software design and all of that. So I know there was a lot of overlapping. Uh, I know the screen was not as uh, active as, as maybe uh, it could have been, uh, but this is my pretty much my first code review. So Thank you so much for sitting in and listening and making it to the one hour and 10 minute mark. It was only supposed to be 30 minutes, but I tend to ramble. So this is a conclusion of my code review. Um, so I am going to take this project here which was Mongo data, uh, MongoDB, uh, PyMongo, it utilized Dash, Plotly, Plotly, uh, Numpy, Pandas, um, and Python. And I'm going to transition this really more of just a, a complete rewrite, I think. Uh, based on what I'm moving it to. Uh, PostgreSQL database. Um, Django as the framework. And I am going to still use Python because, let's be real, Python is pretty awesome. Well, thank you again for sitting in and listening. And um, you, got, you all have a great day or evening, wherever you might be in the world.